Mobile robots have some form of locomotion, and we're going to look at the most common type, which is using wheels. To start off, we'll look at this interesting video for a mobile robotics application. We have a bunny rabbit. I guess this is the Easter bunny. And he is going to deliver some candy to this humanoid robot. Um, he's excited about his candy but the bunny rabbit is careless and ends up with all the candy on the floor. So the humanoid is understandably upset and wants to know what can be done about it. Enter the Kuka U-Bot, which is a research platform on a, it's an omnidirectional robot with a five degree of freedom manipulator mounted on top. We'll talk about these kinds of wheels and some considerations for using them. <coughs> we also have a quadcopter that will identify the objects and it can provide the location of these objects relative to the U-Bot frame. So the U-Bot is able to move in the direction of the target and then use the gripper to retrieve them. Look at how the wheels move relative to each other to get motion in all three directions of the plane. So it's rather counterintuitive control of these wheels. And I guess we can skip to the happy ending. Oh, skip too far. The robot gets his candy, and he's appreciative. All right, now we can look at why mobile robots often have wheels. It's simple to determine the control action needed for a wheel to get the desired motion of the robot relative to, say, for example, a leg robot. Also, wheels are energetically inefficient. Only friction is needed to be overcome. However, wheels are unable to overcome many obstacles, so they have a limited application range. There are many different wheel configurations possible, and we'll look at some different types. First, let's look at the four major wheel classes. We have a standard wheel, which is can a wheel that can be either fixed or steerable. It has, if it's steerable, it has two axes of rotation. One, the rolling axis, and two, the steering axis, which intersects the rolling axis. Then you could have a caster wheel, and these are typically mounted on a robot to provide no constraint to motion, such as on an office chair. Here the rotation, or the steering axis, is um, does not intersect the rolling axis. Next we have a Swedish wheel, and this is a wheel Comprised, comprising a bunch of rollers mounted around the rolling axis of the wheel. And these rollers are at an angle to the wheel plane, and if that angle is 45 degrees, then it'll look like shown here. Or you can also have a 90 degree angle, and that's called a Swedish 90. The fourth type is a spherical wheel, and these are typically not powered, but they can be powered. We'll look briefly at a couple of the wheel classes. So standard and caster wheels, they have a primary axis of rotation, which means that they are directional. The wheel is steered along a vertical axis, as I said. The standard wheel has two degrees of freedom because you have two axes that you can rotate it about. If you steer that, then you don't get any force on the robot because the wheel turns about a uh, point that is on the steering axis. However, a caster wheel, if you steer it, then it's going to impart some force to the robot chassis. The Swedish wheel is like a standard wheel in that it, it's powered in the same manner. The motor for the Swedish wheel goes around the horizontal axis just like on a standard wheel, but it has low resistance in an additional direction. That's the direction that the rollers can turn in. The Swedish wheel has three degrees of freedom. It can rotate about the wheel axle, around the roller's axles, and around the contact point, so particularly the roller that's in contact with the ground. And infinite trajectories are possible if you have the right configuration of Swedish wheels. <coughs> there are different considerations to make when choosing a wheel configuration. The type of wheels are linked to the wheel arrangement choice. For example, there are some configurations of wheels that work with Swedish wheels but would not be feasible with standard wheels or would provide severely limited mobility. And we'll see that in a second. 
There are three robot characteristics that are governed by the combination of wheel type and geometry. They're maneuverability, controllability, and stability. And we'll briefly look at these concepts. And here now are some wheel configurations that are used in mobile robotics. You could have one standard wheel that is driven, and you could have one steerable standard wheel that's not driven. Or two independently driven fixed standard wheels. This is a very common configuration called a differential drive where you have two fixed standard wheels and then you could have an omnidirectional wheel such as a caster wheel or a spherical roller to provide stability. This is a um, figure showing three Swedish wheels and this is an omnidirectional robot. It can move in any of the three directions in the plane. That's two translation and one rotation. And here is an interesting configuration called the synchro drive. Synchro because the wheels turn at the same speeds and they're steered at the same rate. So they're always pointing in the same direction and turning at the same speed. <coughs> this configuration is the one used by the KUKA U-Bot that we saw in the video. You have four Swedish wheels arranged in a rectangle. And here is the arrangement in a car. It's called the Ackerman configuration. And there are pros and cons to all of these configurations. We'll talk about those in a second, some of those in a second. So stability is one, cons one thing that is governed by the wheel configuration. It's possible to get static stability with just two wheels if you have the center of mass below the wheel axle. However, whenever you have this type of configuration, the dynamics are often necessary for to be considered, which might not be the case with, say, the Ackerman configuration. For example, if this robot breaks too suddenly it could flip over. Maneuverability is one of the other three characteristics and here are some examples of maneuverability. Omnidirectional robot like the U-Bot, it can at any time move in any direction in the plane. It can translate to the left or right or spin around the vertical axis. It's common to have less maneuverability than this, so for example using two differential wheels Here's the Amigo bot, which is a differential drive robot. You have two fixed st driven standard wheels and one caster wheel. You can see that this has less mobility because if you want to translate in some direction that's not straight ahead, if you wanted to translate, for example, in the direction of the wheel axes, this robot would require a turn prior to translation. And then a third example that we'll look at would be Ackerman steering. It has pros and cons. It's good for stability in high speed turns, but it has low maneuverability. The direction change, for example, might require a parking maneuver. And then controllability refers to how well one can get the desired motion from the robot. And controllability decreases with increasing mobility. So for a more ro mobile robot, it's harder to achieve the desired motion but you have a greater range of possible motion. Dead reckoning refers to the process of estimating the robot's position based on its starting point and the displacement of the wheels. So for a robot with more mobility, you're going to have a poorer estimate using dead reckoning. As one extreme example, consider a train on a track. If you know the path of the track, then given the train's wheels locations, you have a very good estimate of where it is. Compare that to an omnidirectional robot, which can move in X, Y, and theta at any time. There are a lot of things that can corrupt or worsen the estimate for the position in that situation. And also for increased mobility, it's harder to obtain a given line of travel. So if you compare a car versus a two-wheel differential drive robot, just getting them to go in a straight line. A car, you just need to hold the position of the steering wheel constant. A uh, differential drive robot requires that the two independent wheels have the same speed relative to each other at all times. Otherwise, it'll get off track. Here is uh, another robot example. This is called the synchro drive. And as I mentioned already, it's the reason for the synchro drive is because it steers and has the same speed for every wheel. This configuration can't rotate the chassis, so if you want rotation out of the robot, you might need to add a turret, like on the KUKA robot, it had a um, manipulator mounted to it. So here's a brief video showing an example of a synchro drive. We got this 
commercial for some gum. Guy threw some paper over his shoulder. Uh, but now the trash can catches it. So that's an application for the synchro drive. Mm, let me skip ahead. So here's the hardware for the wheel, steering, and speed. And there are two belts. One belt is for steering and one belt is for the speed. So with these three wheels, it's driven by two motors. So you can see they all turn at the same time and they all have the same speed. And another video is here. All these videos in the PDF, the links go to the YouTube videos. So here's the synchro drive with a connect and it's able to catch the trash. Omnidirectional drive is whenever there are multiple Swedish wheels, or really, that's too restricting. Omnidirectional drive means it can move in any direction, x, y, or theta, at any time. So examples, four Swedish wheels. In that case, the diagonal wheel pair is moving in opposite direction, yields lateral translation, for example. And here's a, we've seen one video of that already. Here's an application for it. So this is useful for scaffolding, or you could also use it for warehousing because of its high maneuverability. So this shows the different ways that it can move depending on how the wheels are controlled. So you can see when they spin opposite directions that you get lateral translation. Mm, you can see how it's useful in situations where you have limited freedom of mobility, confined spaces. But the omnidirectional wheels have such low clearance that they're only useful for mm, environments where you have a smooth surface to roll on. And finally, we have tracks. These um, employ skid steering, and they have large contact patches, which means they're good for maneuverability in rough terrain. But because of the skid steering, it's pretty imprecise um, as far as the amount of rotation that's obtained. They're good on loose terrain, but they're bad on high traction surfaces because you can overload the motors. We've seen a variety of wheels and the fact that the choices made for the type of wheel and the configuration that they're put in have effects on the mobility, stability, and controllability for the robot.